So in part five of this lab, I'm going to put this puzzle away that is in the SEIR interview prep channel because I'm waiting for people to post their solutions and see how creative people are. We're going to hold off on that. Um, in our last part of Cat Collector, part five, um, we established a toy model and created some um, toy data so that we have the ability to view toys in our app, right? So I made a crimson laser, toy, laser pointer and a cornflower blue squeaky mouse, right? So these are the two toys that I can give to my cats, or I will eventually be able to give to my cats. So what we want to do in this many-to-many -many relationships lesson is take those relationships or be able to essentially make those relationships between the cat and the toy. So we need to be able to associate a many-to-many -many relationship with data. How did we do this in uh, Mongoose, using Mongoose? Somebody walk me through the process. Well, what was the, the question again? How did we make a, a, associate a many-to-many -many relationship with two different things in Mongoose? Just um, give me one example of how we did it. Um, there was the um, many-to-many. -many. I want to say the games to uh, profiles. There's okay. many games that could belong to like many people's collections. And then so how did that look? Have... How did that look in our models? Oh, um, in, inside the model we had a object ID reference to the games, and inside the games we had a reference to the movies as an array. Cool. Yeah, exactly. We referenced the object ID. So what we need to do here is we're going to need to reference some sort of other ID, right? We're going to reference a primary key, and that's exactly what we've talked about doing before. The only difference is that. <clears throat> with a one-to-many relationship like we saw before, here, well, let's go through the lesson. You're going to see this. This is what many-to-many -many relationships are going to look like. And what needs to happen is we need to implement a join table, a join table. So unlike MongoDB, which can easily implement both one-to-many and many-to-many -many relationships without much fuss, SQL databases need what is known as a join table to implement many-to-many -many relationships. So join tables provide the glue between the two other tables in a database. Okay, so each row in the join table contains foreign keys for the other two tables' primary keys, <clears throat> as diagrammed here. Let's take a look at this picture. So this is what a join table would look like for what we've got here. Okay, we've got our three cats, each of which have primary, primary keys for their IDs. And we have our table of toys, each of which has a primary key. So if we wanted to associate a toy, say this cat charmer with Biscuit and Morris, that's, that's what that would look like in this table. The cat charmer is index or primary key of one. You can see it's associated with these two cats. You can see that this uh, three catnip banana is associated with Maki and Biscuit, right? That's how this join table is set up. That's the relationship that's being shown here, okay? So note that in practice, the associating of cat and toy is a matter of adding an additional row in the join table. Similarly, to unassociate a cat and a toy, the corresponding row in the join table is deleted. Not a cat row, not a toy row. So this table is essentially the glue that is going to hold both of these things together. Okay. <clears throat> so as usual, the Django framework is going to handle a lot of the heavy lifting with a lot of this stuff. Um, forms and templates aside, all we need to do is implement a many-to-many -many relationship using Django is add a many-to-many -many field on one of the models, create a migrations or create a migration and migrate it. Django is going to ensure that a hidden join table is created that links the rows of the other two tables together. So again, Django does all of the work for us. We just have to add one little, one little line and all of this stuff is set up using the RDBMS. 
fantastic, right? So uh, we need a many-to-many -many field on one of them. Django's going to make sure that we can traverse data both uh, from both models to the related model, but we get to pick the name for the relationship attribute on the model. Um, so let's go ahead and think about what we need to do, right? We're more commonly going to be accessing a cat's toys than a toy's cats, right? We're going to be looking up a cat and having its toys accessible. We're not going to be looking up a, a toy and having its cat accessible. So we're going to add the new attribute to the cat model. So let's go over to our cat model here in models.py. And go back up to our cat model here. And right beneath age, we're going to add a new line that says toys equals models dot many to many field toy. That's a problem. Toy is not defined. Somebody tell me what's happening there. We haven't made it in our um, our table yet. I'm assuming. Right here. You can't reference from the outside in. Not really. Give you a hint. Why did that work? Because of the, uh, it can't be called before it's defined. We didn't define uh, it yet. Python's going to process Is that only that. Python? Yeah, Python's going to, well, it, JavaScript too, depending on how you define your functions, okay. right? It depends on how you declare functions in JavaScript, determining whether or not they'll be in scope for different things and whether or not you're able to access them before they've been defined. Um, but since we only have the one way to define functions in Python, we have to follow Python's rules. And Python's rules say if we haven't defined it, it doesn't exist yet. So we had to move our toy up there for that to work. This is a very important point. You need to make sure that you keep your stuff in order. And order does matter with Python functions. Okay. So now that, that that's working, it's also another reason you need to pay attention to your linting, right? If I do this, put my toy back here, you'll notice the, the linting is like, hey, toy's not defined, problems. Fix it by moving it back up top. Now we're happy again, okay? Because we've made a change that impacts the schema, we have to make a migration and migrate it to update the database. We're going to find a fun bug here. So let's go ahead and kill our server. Let's make migrations. Add field toys to cat. Migrate. Green. Okay, we're going to need to make a fix because we're going to have a bug here. What happens if we try to make a new cat? All cats. Oops, restart this. Add a cat. Roll, roll. What's that showing up? you'll remember in our views where we're using class-based views for cat create, we're saying, give me all the fields, which wasn't a problem before, but it is now. 
So what we need to do is we need to get rid of this. Instead of doing all, we're going to use name breed description and age. And when we refresh, that goes away. You guys smell when I'm stepping in here with that? Okay. So now what we need to do, we have the ability to associate these things. Can we do that in the admin portal? Let's try it. Cats. Let's go Jack. Oh. Okay. Jack was changed successfully. If I go to Jack, you'll see that Squeaky Mouse is highlighted. That's Django's way of showing us that Jack owns a Squeaky Mouse. If I hold Control and select Laser Pointer and hit Save, Jack now owns Squeaky Mouse and Laser Pointer. If I go to Toys and I go to Laser Pointer, we don't really get much information here, right? Because we didn't put that field on here. I can't see which cat this belongs to. But because we put the cat, the info on the cat showing which relationship we have here, you can control or command on a Mac to select more than one, right? If I want to unselect those, we'll do that. Now we're not, there are no association. Oh, I don't know if we can do that. This field is required. Apparently the cat has to have something associated with it. Once it's been added, that's weird. So how do we make this relationship happen in code, right? We've seen through everything that we've done so far that doing it with the admin portal is just a joke. How do we make it actually happen in code, right? That's the next thing. So as a user, when viewing the detail page of a cat, I want to see a list of the toys the cat has and be able to add toys to the list that the cat does not already have, okay? So we're gonna update our cat's detail HTML and this whole section class of toys, I don't, do we have any of that in here yet? That's feedings toy container, that's feedings. So we'll probably put this at the end of, was that feedings toy container a section? No, end of this div. So we can just put it, no, it's going to go after this, right before the end of this div. So let's expand that out. It's going to go at the end of this section. So at the end of this section, we're going to put in a new section. Copy and paste this. Don't get that last div. Okay. No, this is ridiculous. There's a lot of stuff that we just copied and pasted. But this is where it starts. It's just a new section underneath there. Subsection title. We've got, again, some silly cat pictures. Cat.names toys. And then if cat.toys.count. So if the cat has toys, notice cat.toys, right? We've made that association. So being able to display information that we've associated is actually really simple. for toy and cat.toys.all. Again, really simple syntax. It's gonna be the same thing every time. And then we have access for toy in that to iterate. We have a link here for the toys detail that we already have set up. We have a toy color, toy name. Else, so if there's not a count here, we're gonna say poor cat doesn't have any toys, sad cat. 
Okay. If I look now at my app, because Jack has a squeaky toy, I should see that Jack has a cornflower blue squeaky mouse. We're going to add the available toys here in a minute because we're going to have to display that. We're going to have to write some custom functionality into our model there, right? Because we're going to have to display, or actually, we're going to do it on our view function, but we have to find cats or toys that the cat does not have. It's going to be the longest, most ridiculous variable name we've ever made. I think that they, we actually call it toys cat does not have with lower snake case. Okay, but you'll notice now if we go to a cat that I haven't, haven't updated in the um, database using the admin portal, the rubber biscuit does not have any toys. Rubber biscuit is a sad cat. Sphinx cats don't have any fur, why would they have toys? That's just common sense. Um, let's go back here. Let's see what the next place is. Okay, Cheddar doesn't have any toys. We went to the admin portal. We added a toy. Good, good stuff, right? Don't ever give the cat string to play with. That's bad. So what we want to do is we want to display in order for us to be able to add a toy to the cat to make that association. I need a list of toys that are not currently associated with the cat, right? Just like we did with movies and performers. In order to add a performer to a movie, I need to see a list of all of the performers that are not currently associated with that movie. That's what we're going to do. Do you have a question, Josh? Oh, sorry, that, um, that was an accident. It's okay, I'm just making sure. I'm actually really impressed that you guys, I don't have to like constantly mute any of you. Uh, last cohort, I had a student that I constantly, or two cohorts ago, I had a, con a student that I constantly had to mute and it was aggravating. John. Was, like. <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah we, uh, there have been a couple of them then i guess because i was thinking of uh marty i always had to mute marty that was that was fantastic every time they came off of mute they'd forget to put themselves back on mute so i had to constantly go and mute them which was fun but anyway um cool so let's go to this cat's detail request here that's in our views right cat's detail and we're going to make a variable called toys cat doesn't have. Because this is Python and we can roll however we want. Okay. So let's go ahead and put that right under this cat equals. And we'll say toys cat doesn't D O E S N T have equals. And we get to use the ODBR or ODMRB, OD with thing, uh, RDBMS, that's it, Relational Database Management System. Um, that manager has an exclude method to grab all condition or all toys that don't meet the condition that we pass to it. So let's do that. We can write toy.objects.exclude. And it's going to exclude all of the toys that don't meet this condition. What's the condition? ID double underscore in. This is a lookup field to check to see if the model's ID is in a list. So ID in equals cat dot toys dot all dot values list. ID. The only reason I'm getting linting there is because I haven't used this variable yet. I, I know this looks ridiculous, but it's Django. 
You just have to learn how this shit works. It just takes time. It's practice. It'll come with practice. Okay. So the Django query API enables field lookups for every field in the model. ID double underscore in is one such field that checks if the model's ID is in a list and that list is being created with this code. So this code is a list, right? cat.toys.all.values list ID. So this is a list of all of the values for the ID property of all the cats, toys. Say that again. This is a list, it's making a list, checking it twice. I'm like Santa right now. So is that list a dictionary or is it a list? It's a list. It's a list. Mm -hmm. So we're checking to see if the ID in this is in this list. So if I say ID double underscore in equals, it checks to see if the model's ID is in the list that we pass to it, which is right here. Do you have to use this in your code? No. Is it really friggin' cool? Yeah. Okay. So what we want to do is pass this now that we have this figured out in our context dictionary. So we're going to add to this fun little list that we've got going on here. We've got cat, we've got feeding form, and now we've got toys. And this is the first time where we're going to see a different name for something. I don't want to pass a variable called toys cat does not have to my, to my HTML template. Because this is going to be a bitch to like render that, right? I'm going to have to type all that out again. I'm just going to call it toys. But here, I don't want to call it toys because it doesn't represent toys here. It re represents toys cat does not have. So I'm going to pass it like that as toys. Just cleans it up, cleans the HTML up. Fat model, skinny D. I need somebody to make a clever t-shirt that says that. I'll wear it every day for this unit. So line, line, every day. Uh, line 19 is uh, not Python, it's Django. I, I mean, it's both technically. It's yeah, Because in Python, we don't do dot, right? We don't access values doing like the dot notation. Right. It's Django is making a list behind the scenes using a method. That's what's happening here. These are all methods. So I, I know it doesn't look like a method, but that's exactly what's happening here. The dots are all methods. They're not properties. Cool. Hey, Ben, sorry, quick question. Was there anything we had to do with CSS to apply it to toys? Because I have it showing up, but like it's not like you know in a box. Like it's kind of just at the bottom of the screen. Uh, we have toy index and toy detail CSS. Are you pulling my code, or do you want me to paste these in Slack real quick? I know uh, it's because you put the um, you have to put the uh, code for the uh, thing inside mm -hmm. the uh, div right under the section. That's why okay. it's not separate. It's part of the uh, the div for the oh. yeah. Okay, I think. Oh, that, uh, okay. So in details here, you want what we added this section to mm -hmm. go beneath the other end of the section. Don't put it directly at the end of the code. Okay. Oh, I see. Okay. Okay. So that looks good. So let's go ahead and display those things. Let's go back to our detail. 
This is where we're going to display the cat available cat toys right here. Good stuff. Okay. Let's baby step this. And just for right now, well, we'll get rid of this comment. Let's just say if toys.count. So this is if toys.count. Okay. This is available toys, right? So if toys.count, let's say for toy in toys.all for toy in toys.all. And let's just start something simple, make a P tag that says, um, beep, 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 beep. toy dot name. Simple baby baby steps, right? This is how you guys are actually going to be building your apps. So we look at cat, find a cat. Look at that. Available toys. So th they're going to look a whole lot nicer than this when we get done with them, but they're showing up, right? If I have both toys available there, and if I look at Jag, I'll see that I only have the laser pointer there. So that code is working. I think one of the toughest challenges that we have when you guys take these labs and go to do them on your own is that these lessons are built such that we don't really have many problems to work out kinks to as along the way, right? Because they're already refined and they work well. But it's nice to break something every, one, every once in a while and see what happens when you break it. Or it's nice to test something every once in a while like this, right? Baby steps. This is what you're going to be doing in your, your app. You're not going to be writing for toy and toys.all and then have everything spit on the page. You're going to baby step this shit. That's how it works. That's how developers do this in the real world. So it's nice to kind of break things down and do this every once in a while instead of just blindly copying and pasting. I hope we're never actually blindly copying and pasting, but I, I think that's one of the biggest complaints that I get about this unit is people feel like we do a lot of copying and pasting. And it's not because I'm trying to speed through it. It's because there's just a lot of material and we it's more efficient to talk about what we're doing as we do it rather than baby stepping through this code. If we baby stepped through this code, this would take six days to do instead of three. So if there's ever a point where you guys are confused by something we've copied and pasted, I really want you to like make a note to, to say, hey, could you slow your roll there for a second? Speed racer, and, and I'll, I'll explain it. I don't have a problem with that. Just make sure you're speaking up. Y'all are a quiet bunch, so. Tell one of your loud classmates to say something. I'm sure they'll do it. Okay, so let's do what I just said we, <laughs> we weren't gonna do. Let's copy and paste. Um, so let's take, we already have the four toys and all, right? Let's take this and put this on the inside of the if. So that's going to go here instead of this toys.name thing that we have. Okay. And then our else statement was what do we do if the cat already has all the toys? Right? And that situation is cat already has all the available toys. So that's going to go here. Oh, we didn't have an else in there. We just did an if and if. So we need an else. So after the end for, we need an else. There we go. Notice that the else is in line with the if, which is in line with the end if. And the for is in line with the end for. Man, if you don't have these little line doodads, find a way to do it. If you don't like my background, my contrast color, I love this high contrast, I, like low res or super high resolution. Like I can see this from miles away, which is what I like about it. There's no silly fonts. A lot of people like put, I've had three students now in seven cohorts put script fonts 
for their VS code. <laughs> it's like, I don't know how you, I can't debug this. I won't debug this until you fix your font. I've told them that. Please don't use script, especially if you're like sharing your screen for a coding interview. This is a good interjection. If you're sharing your screen for a coding interview, make sure your VS code doesn't look like an episode of like Pimp My Ride. Like, don't do that. You don't want to do that, right? What'd you say, Jurgen? Dog shit. The, don't. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Keep your fonts simple. Make sure that they can see what you're doing. And realistically, high contrast is great because it helps with um, everyone be able to see it. And I have, I've had um, two now visually impaired students and the, I have asked them, and I've learned a ton from that, by the way, if you haven't had the chance to interact with somebody who's visually impaired and get feedback from them on code and like on websites and building things and applications, really like find a place where you can get that feedback or find a place where you're able to get information about how to build something that's accessible to people that are visually impaired. Um, I think a lot of people that I've talked to that are visually impaired will tell you like, I'm always happy to give you feedback on what I can and cannot see access or easily on your page. Like, you know, people with different levels of colorblindness, um, you know, people that just can't see very well. Like it's, there are so many different levels of visual impairment and being able to interact with people and say, Hey, does this meet the criteria that will be acceptable for everyone that has any sort of visual impairment? Like, being able to say that your website is, you know, accessible is huge, especially if you understand what that means, right? You know, if you are able to, to talk to somebody about that and say, hey, what can I do to make my site more accessible? And talk about that in a readme of a project you build, man, that looks good. It feels good too, right? That's, you know, a lot of times we do things because we want to make apps that are going to get us jobs, but like, when you know that you're building an app that's going to be able to be viewed and accepted and seen as it should be by more people, that's just a good feeling, knowing that you're building something that everyone has access to. I had a student yeah. that had a VS Code theme that was a uh, white background, pink font. Uh, my eyes still fucking hurt um, yeah. with that. In Soviet Russia, we sent those people from Gulag. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, just keep your VS code simple. I'm not saying you can't add some style to it, right? Have some fun with it. But like, man, the reason I, I picked this setup is because it's very, very readable. So. And because the high contrast looks really good on a high def monitor. Oh, so on the eyes and very. Yeah. Readable. It's a super dark mode. So anyway. I saw um, uh, some interviewers, uh, they were uh, uh, asking the candidates to uh, write quotes on Notepad. Yeah, no VS Code, like nothing. Yeah. Yeah. That's horrible. Why would you want to do that? I don't know. Oh. And I saw one, uh, one guy, uh, uh, like uh, the interviewer was uh, sharing his screen and he wanted uh, the quotes to be written on the screen, on his screen, you know, like a sharing shared screen. And it was not like VS Code. It was completely different kind of like. That's weird. What, what we're going to do when we do our technical interviews is I'm going to have you guys connect to a live share session. So whoever is working on the problem at the time, we're going to both have access to the same code, which is really cool because I'll be able to see your code as you're typing it. And it'll be shared on the screen as well for everybody else to see. But that VS Code session where I can see what you're working on, I'll be able to easily point things out. Like I'll, if I highlight something, you're going to see me highlight it on the screen. So if I'm talking about your code, it just makes it so easy to talk about code. And you're going to see that I provide a very good situational setup for being able to do technical interviews. Um, we're going to have a lot of fun with it. So. I can't wait to do that, by the way, with y'all. That's going to be a hoot. So it's going to be good times. All right, let's see if this works. We Re refresh. Look at that. Oh, look, there's even a little button, give toy. I forgot to bring attention to that, right? Form doesn't have an action yet. It's, we're going to fix that. 
but give toy, right? Jack already has a Cornflower Blue Squeaky Mouse, which also, if you'll notice, if we click on, takes us to the Cornflower Blue Squeaky Mouse. Laser pointer, okay? If I go to a cat that doesn't have any of the toys, you'll see that it says give toy on both of those. Nifty, okay? An add form has been included, but the action is currently empty because we're gonna implement this in the next section and haven't identified what the path will be yet. So this is what this looks like. Okay, so how do we make the association? First, let's add a new URL pattern. Again, we just have to pick something that makes sense. What do we need? We need the cat's ID, we need the toy's ID. Those are the two pieces of data we need to make that association. So let's get those in our path. We'll be able to rectify that here and put those in here. And now you're gonna to get to see how to use multiple parameters with a URL template tag. Spoiler alert, it's easy. Okay, so let's go into our URLs. Let's add, I think this is the last URL for the day. It's been a, it's been a day. Path, toys, slash, no, not toys, cats. Also, if we wanna keep our paths together, I'm also like a huge fan of that. So I'm gonna do that here. I think it just makes sense to keep all of our cat routes together and all of our toys routes together. So that, that's why I put it there. I think it just looks cleaner that way. That way we don't have cats, toys, toys, cats, 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 toys, cats. Like it's just keep your shit organized, please. Path cats slash int cat ID. slash associate toy, toy because we can call it whatever we want, doesn't matter, int toy ID slash views dot associate toy name equals associate toy. You ready for this? You ready to see how easy this is? All we're gonna do is we're gonna go back to our detail and for our method, URL, URL, associate toy. What do we need to pass it? We need to pass it the cat ID and the toy ID. I mean, we still have to write the function, but URL parameters, that's not as easy. Didn't have to worry about, oh, do we need an underscore here? Does it, we have the model or is it an instance of it? Or is it, it, everything's easier than Django because we have to do all the backend work of looking up everything in the docs, right? When you go out and play with Django, if you were to go out and play with Django on your own, the hardest part about it is reading documentation. Because once you figure it out, just everything is just built to work. But you have to figure out how Django wants you to type it in to get it to work. That's the hardest part about Django. Django is so easy, but it's just massively complicated with the syntax and syntactical standards. And if you don't follow those standards, your shit's not going to work. That's one of the things with full featured frameworks. They're great, super powerful, but you have to play by their rules. With Express, Express can also be super powerful, but it doesn't start off super powerful because everything has to be customized. You have to go in and you have to build everything from the ground up, right? Everything's already built in Django. 
But in order to use it, you have to be certified, right? With Express, you don't have to be certified. You just have to build everything yourself. I'm trying to think of a good analogy here. I'll come up with something. I want to say I had a really clever one last cohort. Something that dealt with cars. Was it learning how to drive a stick? I think that's what it was. I think Django is a stick, like a manual transmission car. It's like there's a lot of power there, but unless you know how to use it, you're screwed, right? That makes sense. That works. Express is like an automatic. You can still learn how to drive it. It's not as hard, but it's not nearly as fun. I think Express is more fun than Django, but that's just because I'm a weirdo. But Cool. All right. We've done that. So now all we need to do is go write our function, right? That's why our server's still unhappy. Um, what are we doing? Okay, here we go, down here. Oh God, this is it, and then we're done. Um, let's go down here and write our new function. Def uh, sos toy request. Remember, we're bringing in two parameters here. We need to keep them in the same order. We had cat ID coming in, we have toy ID coming in. Okay. You're going to laugh at how easy this association is. <laughs> it's a whole one line of code. Cat.objects.get. The ID is cat ID. Dot toys dot add toy ID. That's it. Return redirect. We'll go to cat's detail and we already have the cat ID that we need to pass as a uh, parameter and we're going to pass cat ID. Remember how long the controller functions were for referencing and embedding data in Express? That's three lines of code, one of which is a redirect. Easy peasy. Let's try it out. Row, row. Is it just, let's see if it's just, oh no, we actually have a problem. Toy create dot as view invalid syntax. Say what? urls.py. Did I forget a comma somewhere? I did. Okay. Let's give some, I don't like rubber biscuit. Rubber biscuit doesn't get any toys. Let's give Jack another toy. Oh, look at that. Jack already has all the available toys. Happy cat. Let's go give Cheddar all the toys too. Shazam, Shazam. That's it. Dog oh, Cheddar's hungry. Let's feed him. Breakfast, lunch. And oh, he's going to be a satisfied kitty. Cool. I'm going to add commit and push. What questions do you all have?
that's all I've got for today. Rather than try to tackle AWS today, I'm going to let y'all work on coming up with some project ideas because you need to get those in and approved before Thursday. So you've got time for that. I'm also going to help one of the groups with their unit three project. There's some weird bugs. So we're going to talk about that. You guys, any questions before I turn off the recorder? Going once, going twice.